There's one more award that will be given today. Our commencement speaker, Connie Schultz, is receiving the Advocate for Human Rights Award. Connie Schultz is a nationally syndicated columnist for Create Creators Syndicate and a professional in residence at Kent State University. In 2005, she won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for commentary for columns that judges praised for providing a voice for the underdog and the underprivileged. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, Parade, The Atlantic, ESPN Magazine, and Democracy Journal. Also in 2005, Schultz won the Scripps Howard National Journalism Award for commentary and the National Headliner Award for commentary. In 2003, she was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in feature writing for her series, The Burden of Innocence, which chronicled the ordeal of Michael Green, who was imprisoned for 13 years for a rape he did not commit. The week after her series ran, the real rapist turned himself in after reading her stories. The series won the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Social Justice Reporting, the National Headliners Award, Best of Show, and Journalism Awards from Harvard and Columbia Universities. In 2004, Schultz won the Batten Medal, which honors a body of journalistic work that reflects compassion, courage, humanity, and a deep concern for the underdog. Schultz is also a fellow with the Vietnam Reporting Project. Her 2011 series, Unfinished Business, explored the long-term impact of Agent Orange in the U.S. and in Vietnam. Recently, the series won the Associated Press Managing Editor's Journalism Excellence Award in International Perspective. She's, she has received six honorary degrees and for the last two years has, has served as a Pulitzer Prize juror, juror. Schultz is the author of two books published by Random House, Life Happens and Other Unavoidable Truths, a collection of essays, and, and His Lovely Wife, a memoir about her husband Sherrod Brown's successful 2006 race for the U.S. Senate. She's currently working on her first novel. Schultz and her husband have four grown children and five grandchildren. They live in Cleveland, Ohio, with their rescue dog, Franklin. In many ways, Connie is a change agent. She uses the power of the pen to bring about transformation in our society. Her writing inspires thoughts and actions which lead to positive social change. As we saw with the Michael Green case, she's willing to put her reputation on the line for truth and fairness. She speaks for those who are innocent and need help, but for whom justice failed. She defends them in her communication and urges the community to take action to assist them in their plight. Her Pulitzer Prize winning pieces enlighten us, provide us with new perspectives, and help us walk in others' shoes, which moves all of us closer to social progress. Many of these characteristics are those of social workers and nonprofit leaders who give a voice to those who don't have one. And we know that advocating and fighting for justice through words and actions are essential in order to be a change agent. Therefore, for her significant contributions as a leader, role model, and creator of opportunities for others, the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences proudly bestows upon Connie Schultz the Mandel School Advocate for Human Rights Award. I just want you to know that award is much bigger than the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> it's really big. Well, this is quite an honor. Um, when I agreed to give this commencement address, I did not know that I was going to receive that award. And the first person I told was my husband. Um, and as his want, I got a very tearful <laughs> response. I want to acknowledge two family members who are here with me this morning. My brother-in-law, Robert Clark Brown, who is treasurer of Case Western Reserve University, I don't know, it, uh, I don't think Bob has ever heard me give a speech before, and I don't know what he will think of it, but being a member of the Brown family, I am certain that he will let me know. <laughs> and my husband, U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown, is here. 
Um, I am often asked why, how I knew when I was in love with Sherrod, when I had fallen in love. I had been a long time single mother for a decade when I met Sherrod, and I think they want some really highfalutin answer, something about, you know, his, his heroic deeds in Congress and all the things that he's done for the country, which matter so much to me, but frankly, the moment I knew was when uh, the first time he offered to make coffee for me instead of my making my own coffee, and I assured him that independent me was quite capable of making my own coffee, and thank you very much, and I'll go do that. And he turned to me and he put his hands on my shoulders and he said, please sit down, we need to talk. And then he said, you are not giving up your right to own property or to vote by letting me make your coffee. <laughs> and that is when I knew I was in love with Sherrod Brown. Dean Gilmore, thank you for those kind words. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you to the faculty. I've met so many of your faculty here this morning. Wow, the stories they have and their own stories that they have. Thank you to all the administration who is here, all the family and friends, and to you, the graduates, most of all, to you. And I also want us to acknowledge all the invisible people, most of whom you haven't seen, which is why I'm calling them invisible, who made this day possible for us today, all the staff and all the volunteers. We are always lifted up highest by the people we seldom see, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge them as well today. So please join me in marking them. Thank you. When you are a newspaper columnist, and I've been one now for 14 years, you do hear from readers. And uh, not surprisingly to anyone in this room probably, I have found that not all readers are happy with me. A recent exchange from a male reader resonates for me. Uh, this morning he wrote to me and said, Madam, our newspaper runs your articles. Every single time, for years now, you insert your opinion. This is not journalism. And I wrote back and I said, dear sir, I am a columnist. That means I am a journalist paid to give my opinion. And he wrote back and he said, well, I disagree with every opinion you write, so how can that be journalism? <laughs> but you did write back, which surprised me so much, I just read it to my wife. Now she's mad at me for what I said to you. <laughs> so I guess you won that one. I'm here to share a few of my opinions with you today and to tell a story or two, because that is what I do. In the fall of 1975, my parents loaded the trunk of their Chevy Cavalier before driving 75 miles to Kent State University, where the size of the student enrollment was slightly less than the population of my hometown. I was so scared. After they moved me into my dorm room, I walked my parents back to the car, and then I lingered a bit. This after months of insisting to anybody who would listen that I couldn't wait to leave my small town life behind. My mother was unusually tearful, reminding me to write. My father offered his version of a hug, patting my back with both hands as if he were putting out a campfire. <laughs> his only advice, don't blow this. <laughs> I was the oldest of four children and the first in my family to go to college. From my earliest years in elementary school, my parents talked about when, not if, I would go. Chuck and Janie Schultz, my parents, thought they were two nobodies, but they were going to raise four somebodies. All four of their children graduated from college. They were two people, and, we know, and Dean and I were talking about this earlier because he comes from the same background. They wore their bodies out so that their children would never have to, and both of them died in their 60s. My mom was a nurse's aide. The summer before I left for college, I worked as a waitress, and that was the first time I thought about what those eight-hour hospital shifts were doing to my mother. She'd leave before sunrise, wearing a uniform the color of butter, and return late afternoon, taking time only to change her clothes before she started to cook supper. The one time I dared to complain about my swollen feet, she did not reprimand me. She didn't remind me of how much harder it was for her to work all day on her feet. She just continued to stand at the stove and stir the pot as she turned to me with a tired smile and said, and that is why you are going to college. My dad was a utility worker. He was one of those guys who showered after work at the plant. During the summer months, I would often sit on the front porch swing and wait for the sound of crunchy cinders in the driveway, the signal that dad was home. 
At his lowest moments, he used to say to me, you could teach a monkey to do what I do. So often, my father would pull himself out of the car and at the sight of me, thrust his lunch pail in the air. You're never going to need one of these, he'd say. You're going to college. My four years at a state university changed me in ways neither I nor my parents could have imagined. Our biggest endeavors reveal their impact by how they alter the way we see ourselves. For the first time in my life, I entered classrooms led by adults who wanted to know what was on my mind. College was a place where the professors took me seriously. I can't overstate the impact of that on a working class girl used to being either ignored for her gender or reprimanded for her big ideas. I mention my parents, my roots, because they had everything to do with how I became a journalist, writing stories and columns about people who are too often anonymous and almost always powerless. When people ask me why I keep writing such stories 30 years later, I tell them a story about my mother. I grew up in Ashtabula, Ohio, a little town people, most people notice on their way to somewhere else on Interstate 90. It was my job in the summer months to watch my younger siblings. But at the end of every summer, my mother would do something special just for me. She would ask a neighbor lady to babysit, and we would go to downtown Ashtabula to the department store on Main Street, Carlisle's it was called, and had a diner in its basement. This was a very big deal. This particular year was 1968, and I was 11 years old. I had a toasted cheese sandwich, tomato soup, and a milkshake. Some things you just don't forget. I remember the waitress treating us like family, like so many waitresses do. And we had the nicest time until right towards the end as we were waiting for our check. Our waitress was waiting on another table. The customer was a man wearing a suit, and he was yelling at her. I don't have any memory of what he said, but I recall her saying over and over, I'm sorry, sir, I'm so sorry, until she ran off in tears. My mother, all four feet 11 inches of her, not counting her beehive, turned toward him and tried to stare him down, but he would not look at my mother. So she finally turned to me and said in a very loud voice, honey, don't marry him until you see how he treats the waitress. What mom meant, of course, was how we treat the people we're allowed to mistreat is the measure of who we are as human beings. We all have bad days. Whenever we resist unloading our frustrations on someone who has to take it, we telegraph our respect for them and we affirm our own resilience. With every act of kindness, we make certain we have not become what we loathe in others. My mother's lesson in the diner has stayed with me my entire career. Now, this is often the moment when I talk to graduates about the importance of being activists for kindness. But it's important to know one's audience, and I think you've got that one covered. One of my dear friends, the Reverend Kate Matthews Huey, often patiently engages me in discussions about common notions of compassion and justice, as if we have to strike a balance between kindheartedness and activism. Traditional definitions cast compassion as sympathy, even pity. But I offer a different one, shared with me in the late 1980s by a social worker I met at Metro Hospital. She said, compassion is doing whatever is necessary to heighten awareness. Compassion is doing whatever is necessary to heighten awareness. If that is how we define compassion, we are always doing the work of justice. Most people want to be good. Most people want to make a difference in the world. They want justice. But most people feel pretty helpless to do that. Most of them feel ignored. They are waiting for a reason to make what civil rights icon John Lewis calls necessary trouble. I learned a lot about this notion of necessary trouble and learned a lot about the inherent goodness in people after I wrote about a tip jar in 2004. Sherrod and I were attending, an, uh, it was an event for a nonprofit actually, a charitable event, and it was at the most popular party center in the city of Cleveland. The same, we had, you could tell by the women who were waiting on us, I mean, first of all, they are all women of color, virtually all of them. All of them worked part-time, none of them got any kind of benefits. 
One of those women was standing behind the counter at the coat check at the end of the evening. And this was a large crowd, so it was a long line as we waited for our coats. I was standing there watching um, her, and you could tell that she was tired. But I also noticed there was this giant glass jug. I mean, it was, it was a jug. And it had on, the, on it a, a sign labeled tips. And it was brimming with money, not just singles. There were a number of fives. I saw, I saw a 20 and a 10. I mean, it was, it, it was almost filled to the top. So when it was my turn to hand her the uh, ticket for my coat, I said, you look like you'd like to get home. And she shook her head and she said, I am so tired. And Sherrod was standing behind me and I pointed to the tip jar and I said, well, at least you get these at the end of the night. And she said, oh, we don't keep the tips. And I said, what do you mean you don't keep the tips? Who keeps the tips? And she said, management keeps the tips. And I said, what? And I heard Sherrod behind me say, oh, no. The following Monday, this was a Friday evening, the following Monday I called the management office of the party center and I got a, a middle manager, um, a woman who started yelling at me pretty quickly and she said, Connie, why are you asking this? Nobody cares who keeps the tips. And I said, oh, I think they do. And I, she said, nobody's ever asked who keeps the tips. And I said, that's because you have a sign that says tips and people are assuming it goes to the woman behind the counter. Well, in my profession, you know you're onto something when two hours later you get a call on speakerphone from two vice presidents of the company and you didn't call them. You really know you're onto something when the word, first words out of one of the men's mouths is, Connie, there's no story here. <laughs> I laid out to them what I just told you and I said if they were willing to change their policy, that's the story I would do but they assured me that nobody cared who keeps the tips. I wrote the column, as I've just told you, and I ended it with this. I simply said, they say you don't care who keeps the tips. I think they're wrong. What do you think? They changed their policy by 11 a.m. the next morning on the most popular radio show in Cleveland. And the reason they did that is because thousands of readers started weighing in, not just with me directly, but at the party center. They're calling into the radio show who read the column online. And I learned something really valuable in that moment. That's what I mean when I tell you I know most people are good people. Most people want to make a difference in the world, but they don't know how. And that's something you'll be doing day in and day out. You're showing them how. In this current political climate, we have many opportunities to make necessary trouble. Certainly in your chosen profession, with your conscience finely tuned to justice, you see such opportunities in your every waking moment. I run a public Facebook page. It's got about 152,000, I don't like to call them followers because that sounds like a cult. Let's call them subscribers. And we have discussions every day and I insist on civility and most of the time we manage it quite well. But I have noticed a trend in recent months where someone will show up and call either me or liberals in general libtards. Most of the time, I just deleted the comments, but finally I'd hit my breaking point. And so instead, I posted a photo. It is a black and white photo. I am a kindergartner riding on the back of my uncle, my arms wrapped around his neck, my bare toes pointing to the ceiling as I peek out from behind his head. In the background, my grandmother's wet laundry hangs from little hooks along the archway, which tells me this is a photo in the dead of winter in the snow belt of Ashtabula County. This is what I wrote to go with that photo. Today I deleted several references to libtard in comments thread on my wall, as I always do when I see the word. A reader privately suggested I, I grow a thicker skin if that word bothers me. I was going to brush it off as I usually do, but then I thought about why the word bothers me so much. His name was Francis, Uncle Francis, to my siblings and me. He was my mother's brother. In this picture, he's in his late 20s, holding up five-year-old me at my grandmother's house. He was my mother's big brother in size and chronology, but not in aptitude. She was fiercely protective of him until he died in his 50s. Only family members could understand his speech well, and so he tended to be very quiet in other people's homes and in public. I remember cuddling with him on the couch as a child to watch TV, he loved cartoons, and sitting on the floor with him to play with his toy cars. He was polite and gentle, and the object of unkind remarks and stares from strangers 
all of his life. Call me a liberal and I'll say thank you. Call me or anyone on this page a libtard and your comment will disappear. I hope this helps to explain why. What unfolded, of course, I don't even need to tell you, I suspect you already can imagine in the comments thread, story after story about other people's Uncle Francis, their children, their siblings, their uncles and aunts. We know this. We know there are so many out there who are just waiting for one person to step up and say the word. We must always be ready to make necessary trouble. I know you already understand that. In a world of so many bystanders, you are the upstanders. And that comes with a cost, which brings me to the only bit of advice I have for you. You are leaders in a profession designed to change the world. The most tired and weariest people I know are those who work day in and day out to improve the lives of the forgotten and the ignored. Leadership is lonely and it is exhausting. The good people you serve take everything you think you have to offer and then ask for more. They're not selfish necessarily and they're certainly not aware of how demanding they can be. So often they meet you at the end of a long and brutal road. They look up to you, they count on you. You're the fixers, you are the lamplighters. For an awful lot of people, you are their last hope. It is humbling to be on the receiving end of such a profound belief in your abilities, of a certainty in the depth and breadth of your generous hearts. It also can be unnerving. And a common side effect of leadership is your belief that you must show no weakness, no flaws. I want to suggest to you that if you think you have to mask your humanness, you will never discover the full capacity of your influence, your ability to heal hearts and men's lives. When I first became a columnist, inevitably women would ask, doesn't that angry hate mail bother you? And these were during speeches when we'd have Q&A. And at first I used to say, oh no, it doesn't bother me. And you know, I realized why that didn't work. Number one, it was a lie. Of course it bothered me. And number two, if I held myself up as somebody different from the rest of them, I couldn't reach any of them. I would never close that distance. Now I'm, about to, I'm not about to compare myself to any of you. I get a lot of attention for what I do, and no one is going to call me today because strangers just banged on their door and dragged all of their belongings to the curb, because a daughter has been diagnosed with cancer, and they have no car, no doctor, no idea of what comes next, because someone somewhere has decided today is the day he or she just cannot take it anymore. That's your job. Those are the calls you get all the time. So often, in their saddest moments, you are the only one who holds up a mirror that reflects a better version of themselves. You show them what you see in them. But here's my certainty. People who respect you and who admire you, even love you, and that would include your family and friends here today, are hungry for signs of your own struggles, your own moments of uncertainty that took you on a journey to a different place from where you started. What I'm asking today is that you share your own stories. Why are you here? Of all the ways you could have carved out a life, you chose this. I know it's not for the money. So why are you here? Not only do I think sharing your own story helps others, having to think about your life, your calling, and why you're doing what you do is a process that rewards the author of that story most of all. I often say I don't really know my opinion about something until I have to explain myself in a column. I am here to tell you that when it comes to self-awareness, there is no substitute for asking yourself the same questions you've been asking people who turn to you in the hardest times of their lives. Right now, there's a lot of excitement about development in downtown Cleveland. But Sherrod and I live in zip code 44105, where the, one of the highest foreclosure rates in the country. We are surrounded by blight. The murder rate in our city is up. Children are being shot and they're dying. The challenge is how to help everyone understand that it's not about us versus them, that it's not about those people, but rather our community, our brothers and sisters. Last October, I interviewed Samaria Rice, the mother of Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy who was shot and killed by two Cleveland policemen in a public park when he was playing with an air gun. She told me she watches that video. We've all seen that video, have we not? Those final seconds 
when her son was still upright with his whole life ahead of him. I watched that video over and over, she told me. I have to. It's the last video I have of my child alive. I see that police car speed up to Tamir. There's no time. There's no time for my boy to understand what is happening. She took a deep breath and stared straight ahead as she continued to speak. He didn't have a lot of suspicions about people. I look at him in that video and I'm wondering, what are you thinking right now? Do you know what's about to happen to you? In 2008, I was writing about race because we had the first African-American nominated to become president of the United States. I come from the white working class and I understood exactly what was going on, but I didn't know how to reach a lot of them. And so I turned to our friend, Congressman John Lewis, who barely survived the march in Selma 51 years ago when they crossed that bridge in, a, in an effort to fight for the right to vote. He is a hero to so many, including me. And I asked him, I said, John, I'm trying to reach more of these readers. I'm trying to change their hearts. How do I do that? And his advice has stayed with me ever since. He said, Connie, I don't need their hearts. I just need them to do the right thing. It reminded me of what Martin Luther King used to say. You can't make them love us, but you can stop them from lynching us. My goodness, how we need all of you in this world. But please take care of yourselves. Give yourself those quiet moments to watch your world unfold in front of you. Sometimes the emotion of such moments can wash over us and render us speechless. I have lived long enough to know that when I have no words, my heart will readily take over and freeze that memory for times when I start to get a little scared about where we're headed as a country and as fellow human beings. We have a lot of framed family photos on the walls of our home, photos of our four children in every stage of their lives, and now our five young grandchildren. One, is, one of the photos is positioned at the bottom of our stairs, so that it's the first thing I see when I come down every morning, and it's the memory that lifts me up the stairs at the end of the long days. It is a photo from the hour before our youngest daughter's wedding. The makeup artist has just finished with her face, and Caitlin has turned in her chair to smile at our grandson, Clayton, who is seven years old. In the picture, his hands cover his face. Because I was standing in the doorway watching this moment unfold, I know why. After Caitlin smiled at him, Clayton's small hands flew up to his face and he said, you're so beautiful, I could faint. <laughs> there is magic in those quiet moments when we give ourselves permission to do nothing but take it all in. And now I leave you with one last story. It's about another influential woman in my life, Sheridan Bob's mother, Emily Campbell Brown. Emily Campbell Brown was born in Mansfield, Georgia, and married a doctor and moved to Mansfield, Ohio. Born, in, uh, born and raised in the Deep South, she shed much of that history when she came to Ohio and became a civil rights activist all of her life. In 2008, when she found out that nobody was making an effort to register voters in the poorest part of town, she, every week, loaded her card table in the trunk of her car and drove to a shopping center in the heart of the black community. Before election day, she registered more than 1,000 voters. Emily Campbell Brown was diagnosed with a terminal disease right after the election. She was determined to live to see the first African-American man sworn in as president. And so we got hospice involved, and Bob was with her on the day of the inauguration. She insisted that Sherrod and I go to Washington, and Bob sat with her. We had her hospital bed right in the living room so that she could watch it on TV. A few days later, Sherrod, all the, the three brothers were helping to take care of her, and the wives, all of us wives, were helping too. And one day, it was Sherrod's in my turn, and it was one long room, so I could sit at the dining room table and watch this scene unfold. And Emily turned to Sherrod and said, Sherrod, I would love to hear the song Beautiful Savior from our Lutheran hymnal. And Sherrod, being the dutiful youngest son, of course, went into the family library and brought the hymnal out. Now, those of you who know my husband or have heard his voice, you know he talks like this. He sings like this, too. Beautiful Savior. So I'm sitting at the table and I'm watching my husband bent over holding the hymnal and he's reading, singing three verses of that song to his mother. The very next day, 
she turns to Sherrod and says, oh, Sherrod, I wish our friend Janine were here. And Sherrod said, well, why is that, mother? Now, understand, Janine had one of the most beautiful singing voices of anyone we knew. She said, I would love to hear her sing, Beautiful Savior, from our hymnal. And I'm watching this, sitting at the dining room table, and Sherrod said, well, mother, don't you remember I sang three verses of that song to you just yesterday? And she said, I know, honey. You're better in a group. <laughs> well, aren't we all? Let us not forget that. Let you not forget that. You are surrounded not just by colleagues and friends, but fellow warriors for justice. And may you never forget the strength that comes from that camaraderie. Congratulations, and thank you for choosing this for your life's work.